So we have a little, little joke to start the morning. So, I mean, you see the acronym, and uh, Brady is not on the back. Uh, <laughs> Anton Wolf should be on the back. So, but good morning, and uh, thank you for Argon for having us here this morning. And uh, we look forward to being, you know, sharing with you. And during the course of the next hour and a half, we'll have some time to do some Q and A with you from the audience as well. Uh, so we encourage you to be as engaged as as you, as you want to be and can be. Uh, you've got a good diverse group here uh, with different skill sets and backgrounds. And uh, we're going to kind of tip some key topics as you would expect. Um, but the open forum portion is is yours. So wherever you want to go, uh, do that. And if you do, as we're hitting particular topics. Um, you know, you want to hit something that we've kind of hit a, a, a nerve, if you will, in terms of something you want to focus on that we're addressing at that point. Just go ahead and raise your hand and, and we'll go ahead and take that up as well. So, Curtis, good morning. Can you make sure you can hear us? Okay, very good. All right, so uh, we're going to start out this morning kind of a little bit of rapid fire. We're going to have two couple of segments where we do this kind of uh, approach. And so for this morning, we're going to start with kind of top two or three tips from each individual of the panel uh, in terms of what we call their secret sauce. Each of them is here for a reason in terms of what their uh, experience and their focus is in their laboratories. And we're gonna just jump right in. So Randy, we'll start with you. She's the one that was the most nervous, I think, amongst all of us, yes. outside of me. Um, Go for it. And so yeah. just get that band-aid right off the way. Uh, so human resources, workforce culture, and, uh, and team training to kind of give some top two, three tips that you're doing at the laboratory now. Um, right now, we're just really focusing in on our people. Um, we make sure that our environment and the people that we bring in fit our work culture and our environment. We want to make sure, we all know it's really hard to find technicians right now. We'll bring in somebody. Um, we want to make sure that they are positive, they're willing to learn. They may not have the most experienced background, but if they are willing to come in and learn, we'll be willing to teach them. Um, we always want to make sure, even if they are a very experienced technician, that if for some reason we don't think they're going to fit our culture, we may not necessarily go with them. Um, we just really try to focus on the people right now. And we did that before COVID too, but since COVID, the way we've been growing, um, we just want to make sure that the people that we're coming in, we take care of them, and they're in return kind of taking care of our offices. So um, we've just experienced a lot of growth since COVID, and we just feel like we're really focusing in on the people, making sure they're happy. We don't want them to get overworked with how busy we are right now. And um, yeah, in return, they're just kind of taking care of the rest of the offices for us. Very good. Thanks, Rick. All right, Curtis, um, you focus a lot on dental school relations and certainly have done a full transition to digital. So uh, give us kind of top two or three things that your team's focused on and kind of some of your success stories in that area. Talk a little bit about chair-side services, and you've got a team uh, that you focus yeah. in that area. Yeah, I think uh, like the term full-service dental lab, as we all kind of grew up knowing it, has evolved into even more. I mean, we're doing surgical guides, chair-side services, clear aligners. So when you really look at servicing your customers, uh, that's where we're really focused on and, and building out our customer service, not only external but internal inside the lab as your departments grow, making sure your managers aren't all tied up on the phone. So you have enough, some of our most technical people are on a phone all day in a technical call center with support people to help do the data entry. So our managers can oversee the, uh, you know, the workflow and the quality of the work. But back to your question, but yet yeah, chair side service has been a huge um, inroad for us. It's almost like its own sales engine. You know, we 
we know those specialists are like our mutual partners with the GPs. So it really opens doors to their whole referral base. And we're doing a lot of RCE events with specialists who are bringing 40, 50 of their referrals together. And these cases are usually hard and I mean, they're complex. You get a lot of the specialists saying, hey, it's Dr. So-and-so's first one. Can you, you know, this, that. And boy, when you, you make that connection and that relationship and you take a doctor from their first full arch to the next 20, you're getting the zirconia crowns, the dentures, and everything else by the time you, you're all said and done. So uh, it's a little disruptive in the lab. It's a change. You need to have resources to go out and be on the road. And, and I can talk in depth how we do that, but it, it, it does disrupt your lab. You can't have your top denture technician running out doing a conversion for four or five hours and driving an hour there. So it's how we started, but we learned and we, we have uh, full-time people, two, two technicians, that's all they do is go around and, and do conversions and impressions. Uh, we have 10 locations, so out of each location we have a person in each location that can run across the street or down the street and do those cases too. So it brings in a lot of, a lot of new business for us. So. Very good. Brent, I mean, it's certainly coming out of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. We're a little bit somewhat still in it, I guess, if you would say, but just in terms of merger and acquisition activity, We've got a, obviously an aging demographic in the in the marketplace, and then but, but certainly I mean just from the last kind of two or three months from what we're seeing, you know, laboratories are really just booming in many respects. So maybe people who might have wanted to transition out or sell, maybe they're going to stay a little longer to raise their EBITDA. But to kind of talk about some of merger ac acquisition activity you see in the marketplace right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, COVID uh, set us back a little bit there because everybody got knocked off. And when everything came back, everybody was so busy, they were just trying to get the work out the door and such. And, you know, some of those conversations we were having with other laboratories to join the platform have now been picked up again. And uh, there's a lot of activity of having laboratories, you know, right around the size of Frontier uh, merge with our platform and it could be either because of a succession plan because they, they want to be able to the owner wants to probably step out and have a succession plan because they don't really know how to do that without maybe joining a bigger platform that gives the uh, the the management team under them uh, who's been doing a lot of the work and you know been there for 20 25 years gives them an opportunity to step up and then really feel like they're running their own thing as well too and so it's, it's important for us as we're looking at these uh, these opportunities that you know, number one, we you know go in and do no harm because uh, the one thing is that they're they're running a fantastic laboratory anyway. I still run Frontier you know, day to day oper operations to that, so I wear two hats on that. But every <laughs> laboratory, their DNA and their culture is just a little bit different. So it's important for me, especially from a California guy, you know, going to the, go to the change, change the, the Midwest uh, uh, laboratory does things to be able to maintain that. And of course, respect the legacy too. A lot of the people that I've known, probably a lot of people in here have uh, you know, either started themselves from nothing, started with their family, and then they worry about, you know, hey, I'm giving up control and what's, you know, in, you know, what's gonna happen. But we focus on, you know, really, you know, they can stay around as long as they want, they can keep their the culture, keep their DNA, and then and again, again, give those uh, uh, employees an opportunity to grow. We really, you know, want, we, we encourage that. And because uh, a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, owners, they're going to still be in the community and such. And they're very, very concerned. The first thing that uh, the conversation we had is like, what about my employees? Well, as Randy said, it's like, we need employees badly. So we, by no means do we want to lose them at all. But but more importantly, without them, it's it's important to be able to do that. And then, of course, honor the entrepreneur in them as well, too. A lot of the times they want to be able, everybody wants has all these dreams and schemes they want to do, but maybe in their own little unit, they have a hard time uh, doing that. So what they want to do is we we band together and then we can be able to do some more things and kind of that, you know, it's a kind of a cliche, but it's kind of together stronger type of thing. And so, so that's what we really kind of focus on. And it's starting to pick up again uh, with our platform and uh, should, you know, have some exciting things happening this year. So good. Um, before we transition to kind of next area, I just want to kind of just do a poll to the audience. So how many of you are, are owners of dental laboratories? Just show our hands. A vast majority. How many of you, to Brent's point, are second or third generation laboratory or transition? <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. Very good. Um, we're going to talk. Go back to Randy's first topic on workforce culture and uh, recruitment and retention. We're going to kind of just throw everything we can as it relates to to the personnel uh, labor component, and just talk about what you're seeing, how you're, what things you're doing, best practices to to attract people, retain people. 
Uh, and then once you get them in the door, how are you training them? We're, we obviously have um, 13 accredited schools left in the U.S., which is not enough, clearly. Um, so you're having to go back to really doing it in-house uh, in a significant way. And obviously, you're trying to integrate multiple types of new technology into the mix of that, too. So business model changes with your client base. So how are you wrapping all that together and trying to get a good outcome in terms of your personnel and your training and, and, and bringing them forward from a career path standpoint? Um, yeah, we do work. You guys hear me? OK. Um, we also work with other dental schools and high schools in the area. But when we do bring in new technicians, um, whether they have experience or not, we also put them through like an internship program in the lab. So they'll sit by and see every step along the way. And they get to learn the processes, but it also helps them meet the people and kind of feel more comfortable before they jump in and start doing anything. Um, we always let people know, experienced or not, they aren't going to come in and just kind of start working or start producing right off the bat. They're always going to get to know people. Um, every lab does everything different, so they have to learn our processes and how we do things. Um, we really try to keep it, like I said, we're third generation, so family focused. When people come in, the one thing that I've always noticed is the first week, they're always going to be late for whether it's traffic or weather, and they always call in a panic because they're going to be five or ten minutes late. And it's like, it's okay. Drive safe. Make sure, like, we're not sitting there making sure you're punched in right at eight o'clock or whatever it is. Like, we want you to be comfortable with what you're doing. Um, the people we bring in, we feel like we trust to make good decisions and take care of their own workload. Um, we want to make sure that if they have a family event or a sick kid, like, we're going to let them go home, see their kid after school, take care of them, and just kind of provide that open atmosphere. And then in return, they feel a little bit more community. They feel um, like they belong in the workplace. And then in return, they're helping our offices. But I think the internship program we do is a big thing for training, whether you're experienced or not, just kind of learning your own lab's ways of doing things. Um, yeah. Curtis, I, did you hear the full question, I think? <clears throat> okay. Uh, everybody in our area is kind of fighting for the same technicians. And to be quite honest, they're the ones that are looking for jobs, you know, nobody really wants. I hate to say that, but that's kind of the truth. Um, so uh, this past summer, I started a course with uh, Texas A&M School of Dentistry where we had all the D3 and D4 students come through the lab and rotate through uh, every Friday and just teaching them what the opportunities are in digital dentistry. Now, uh, by doing that, I recruited 13 of them that now come in in the evenings and uh, are doing digital dentistry. So one night, a group of them will come in and scan and design cases and either print or mill or whatever the process is, the next night they come in and actually finish the crowns. I've got one of the instructors from the school coming in and managing them, and I, my deal with him is, is if you wouldn't use it in your practice, I'm not paying you for it. So, uh, so we have a steady supply of, of new technicians that way. Uh, when these students graduate, the deal is that they're gonna teach the next generation or the next class to come in and do the same thing. Um, so that's one way we're kind of thinking outside the box. Um, also, uh, I'm doing the same thing. I'm working with some of the local high schools. And actually this summer, I'm going to go do a presentation to the Texas Education Board trying to get dental lab technology approved as an approved course in the high schools in Texas. So the problem that we see in our industry is people don't know we exist. And so we just really, as business owners, we have to go out there and beat that drum and, and let people know what our industry is and what the opportunities are. And once again, just think outside the box and figure out how we're gonna get that next generation into the lab. So that's uh, some of the processes that we're doing right now. Very good. So Luke, you've got 10 locations. So one, one lab's tough one enough, so you've got 10 locations. How are you getting your people to retain it? Yeah, um, St staffing, obviously with COVID too, there was a lot of people staying home and, and that was a challenge. So 
we're 80 miles southwest of Chicago, so we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's a town of 20,000 people, and I'd say the closest lab is probably an hour away from us. So, you know, it's always been, this is our 85th year in business, so it's always been about taking local people and training them. And we have generations of, you know, the mother's retiring, the son just started, so it's kind of cool to see that. Um, we have a full-time recruiter. That's all she does all day is online Zooms and, and um, we're getting more people in that way, but we had to raise all of our starting rates. You know, it was pressure. I'm sure you all felt it when Targets and everybody else was out paying out our starting wages. I mean, that was a challenge. So we had to bring that up. So that's bottom line coming up. But um, we show everyone we have, this has kind of been our secret sauce over a lot of years, is our level system, which we have a level one technician, two, three, four, five, I'm sorry, four, and a level four with a CDT. And then your go senior dental technician with a salary. Um, but within each level, there's tasks tied to it. So if you come into our lab as a 19-year-old kid or something, you know, you can do the math and know you're going to get a review every six months. And hey, if this is a good option, I could be making X by the time 10 years from now. So we sh show you everything. And then, of course, we have training that supports all that. So we have uh, facilitators that are almost like retired, not retired teachers, but former teachers that do the PTC book work and then you know this is your first three months and then you work with a technical uh, trainer you'll work off uh, off the production floor in a training lab and then we bring the technician out the trainee out to the manager knowing all right they're about 30 percent productive you know and then we have people on the floor that work up speed but we get the quality down um, and something else that's really cool so we really value CDTs and, and training and 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 that's a huge thing for us. We have a CDT study club to help our, our uh, technicians prepare for the CDT exam. There were a lot of years where we saw too many, you know, people passing this part, failing that part. So it was, what can we do more? And we have a, a, a CDT study club to, once they get to level four, you know, it's a whole nother pay grade when you get that CDT. So we incentivize that, do a bonus on the CDT. And uh, we have about 30 technicians in a CDT study club at all times. And, uh, we have a real seasoned uh, person who, who facilitates our CDT and we zoom it in so all facilities can plug in and, and partake. It's over eight months a year, one time a month. So we're just growing people and we do, you know, through acquisition, find talent that way or recruiters. We kind of use about all of it, but we pretty much grow our own. That's kind of our Brent? way to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I echo what uh, Luke was saying there. It's like, you know, uh, we're, we try to, you know, do a lot of growing of our own. We're actually, just because we're in California, we're actually a suburb of Sacramento. We're sort of out in the middle of nowhere also, actually. And um, so we do a lot of growing of our own. I think the thing that's really helped, and especially with the, with the guys downstairs with the technology, is that with, with the increased uh, ability to go through uh, digital workflows and such, and uh, and bringing some people in that are sort of kind of off the streets type of thing, and and, uh, and getting them involved in that as far as uh, you know, learning to scanning, designing, and such. So it's it's interesting because I got a whole you know at least one in, in uh, California, you know, a whole different division, the digital department. That that place they think they work for Google, you know, they think they work for Apple, you know. In fact, I was asking a few of them that had been with me for a couple of years. I said, do you think you're a dental technician? Because no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a digital specialist, you know. And I think you know, with that, uh, that's been uh, very, very uh, helpful. Plus, what you know, when, in kind of the beacons in the laboratory, you do have those people that understand dental technology classically, and they understand to be able to do that. So it's the, the training through the osmosis and kind of doing this thing is going to bring these kids along, you know. And you know, uh, Gil and I were noticing walking the halls yesterday. It's like, look at all the young people. You know, they're all young. You know, and uh, and uh, it's, it's really, really exciting. What an exciting time for them, and they're really, really into it. And as they transition from learning from the technical side to the digital technology side, it's kind of a cool little niche they have. But but also on the on the the side of retaining them, you know. You know, last year with uh, obviously coming out of COVID and everything like that, with our capital expense budget, we got the machines, we got everything like that. But now our capital expense budget this year is like really Googleizing the lunchroom, you know, and uh, making it so it's like really, really neat and you know, people like to work there and such. And uh, and uh, it's kind of the year of the employee right now. And uh, and so we just you know do what kind of everybody else does and just you know treat them very, very well and, and train them and give them that opportunity to to really grow. Okay, good. 
I'm going to segment it just for visualization, but just, uh, you know, how many of you have either, you know, either part-time or full-time in-house HR administrator where they're really just doing, you know, the hiring, onboarding process, obviously benefits administration. So how many of you have somebody at least functionally for performing that role in-house? Yeah, we do. We have kind of a robust HR department to help with benefits, claims, and take care of people. I mean, overly just want to make sure they have access to resources. We do 401k training, you know, or, you know they have one-on-one -on -one opportunities with financial advisors that come in from Chicago. So yeah, we, we do a lot of HR activity. Yeah. Yeah. Curtis, what about you? Did you hear that? Um, but, you know, as far as getting new hires and things like that, um, I mean, we rely a lot on our existing technicians to talk to their friends and things like that. You know, the one thing that I always tell, uh, especially all of our managers, when they get frustrated with new hires, I always tell them that every one of us had our first day in this business. And to look back on our first day and, and just think about if, if whoever was our mentor got discouraged with us and turned their back on us, would we have grown to where we are now? So, um, so I, I'm always encouraging uh, our managers and our staff to really look at their friends, people that are, are motivated. That's what I'm looking for. I don't really care about the experienced technician. I'm just looking for motivated individuals that will, uh, you know, learn and, and want to learn a new, a job or a new career. That's what we're looking for. Okay. And just going back, to, just, going just back in terms of uh, terms separating of the, the HR function HR from just training and development. So how many of you, it may be the same person in some cases, but how many of you have somebody that's full-time training and development just in terms of whatever your, your, your core curriculum, if you will, in terms of your processes, your systems that are focused on that. And, and that could be maybe somebody in-house or outside consultants that you bring in for that purpose. How many of you are utilizing somebody for that purpose? We don't have like somebody designated just for that. It's kind of a more so a team effort. Um, I take care of some of the HR responsibilities. My mom's also in the lab and does some as well. And then we work with like 401k, financial advisors who can come in, but we don't have a set trainer or HR person. Yeah, we um, we are just you know working to, to bring on an HR person right now. You know, it's either it's usually you know myself, uh, my lab manager in Aurora Hills, and uh, our CFO. We've been doing that, but it just gets a little bit too much. And so we are now uh, we just actually hired a person uh, two weeks ago, as a matter of fact, to start uh, getting all those functions and just those things so we can leverage ourselves to have them do some of those things and get uh, get a, a steady stream of people coming through the door to uh, interview. Uh, Curtis talked about you know recruiting dental school students, but just to, in terms of dental laboratory technology schools, and obviously you're in different locations, but and there aren't really probably any close to any of you per se. But I mean, are is though are though are you having contacts with some of their faculty in terms of students coming out of those types of programs, uh, either the associates or you know bachelor's degree program that's in Indiana? Do you have any luck with that? We made contact with, uh, unfortunately, Illinois has like nothing, none. Yeah. Triton used to be. We, we have a lot of technicians that went to Triton, but um, no, like uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, we, Iowa, we've made contacts there. So, yeah, we're anxious. As we've expanded labs into those states, now we actually could tap maybe into that a little better. Okay. Yeah. Brent, you've got several California schools, but mostly in Southern California. Mostly in Southern yeah. California, so it's kind of uh, hard to tap into those. I know uh, at the, at Newark, there's a, um, a school up there. I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but um, but there is a way that they're they're feeding into that, and uh, I think uh, it, it has been positive, you know. Okay. But as as uh, Curtis said, you have to. Some of the older technicians get a little frustrated with the young bees, but they have to understand that. <laughs> We all cast stuff on the wrong metal before, too. You know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. I mean, just talking about training and, and education in general, I mean, have, have your partnerships with, you know, supplier vendors, has it changed in the last three or four years just in terms of the, I get not, not necessarily the relationship, but just in terms of the types of things that you're calling upon them to provide, either, you know, for your teams or just, you know, just training? What's that look like now for those partnerships? I, we, uh, it was nice. We, I mean, 
sometimes we don't always think about our event, you know, to, t to call and say, hey, what can you offer, uh, you know, help us out with? Um, we at Argen did a comprehensive two-day work, like overseeing our zirconia production, where we were doing things a little wrong, and, and it really, really helped us out. Um, just last week, I had a, a Paul Kiscoen was on with our, one of our big customers that has, you know, we were doing a Zoom CE event. So yeah, it's, I mean, not to, sorry to plug you, Arjun, but you've been great to me lately. No, so it's, there's serious support out there. And I think we just got to look outside our wall sometimes and, and pick up the phone and ask for a little help. Yeah, I agree. Um, reaching out to partners is very important, whether it's for training or you just have a problem in the lab, making sure you have those connections and you know you can call somebody. Um, and be, like the vendor partnerships and other lab partnerships, um, thinking of each other as somebody you can lean on and ask questions to and not just competition. Whether you're next door to somebody or across the country, same size, different sizes, like everyone wants to help each other. Um, we've been reaching out to other labs a lot, just for meetings like here, getting to know other people. And if you have a question, if you call somebody, either they've already had that question and can help you, or if they haven't had the question, they're like, oh, I might need to know what happens when I do come up with this. So that's very important. Um, we had, we were just talking about this earlier with my husband, Argan, reach out to people. We were having problems with a different brand of zirconia and they came to our rescue and helped us with that brand and we weren't even using them at the time. So just building those relationships and getting to know people within the industry is gonna help you, it's gonna help you train people. When there's a problem, learning the whys is just gonna help you in the process of what you're doing, so. Curtis, anything you wanna add? Well, <clears throat> we do utilize our reps uh, quite a bit. But the, the one thing that I'm a big believer in, instead of just constantly taking from them, we also give a lot, which means that our reps know that when another lab is having issues with something, we are available to them to call us. Um, it, it's not, I don't look at competition like a lot of people do. It, to me, it's not competition. We're all in this game together. There's so much work out there that we can all help each other. So I, I really utilize our reps and let our reps utilize us to help them with the, their other customers. So that's one thing I'd really encourage other labs to do is, is stop looking at everybody else's competition and, and we're, we're all in this game together and, and we can definitely help each other to really grow this industry. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, unfortunately for uh, uh, Stephanie, the, the higher up in uh, Oregon, she's like five minutes from the laboratory. So I'm always like, Stephanie, <laughs> SOS type of thing. She goes, oh, yeah. I know she's not a rep anymore, but I could, I just have her on like the the red phone. I could pick up and everything. But you know, they, they've been very, very supportive of uh, what we're doing and uh, being able to troubleshoot a lot of stuff, even on the actual uh, um, the clinical side as well, too, as far as uh, you know, uh, doctors having uh, issues with their scanners and such. You know, they're actually a plethora of uh, information to be able to help us out. I, I think it, 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 it's just invaluable to have uh, those uh, resources available to you and, and you know, like talking with the other laboratories and such. And, and uh, in fact, you know, as we, as we bring other laboratories on, it's amazing you know, some of the issues that we have um, has already been solved elsewhere. And uh, that's very, very, very important because as uh, 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 Curtis just says, like, you know, it's, it's important to, to really grow this thing and move this thing forward. You know, we have uh, bigger fish to fry. You know? okay. Uh, before we transition to the, um, to the audience, just I want to hit something that's just relative to these partnerships, whether it's with other laboratories or your vendor partners. You know, during COVID, I mean, obviously we, we weren't here last year uh, at this meeting or meetings like this uh, for, you know, in some cases, two years. So how did, what, how did you, uh, I guess I'd say, maximize those relationships and, and, you know, what types of additional resource networks did you bring to the table to help help you get through that? Whether it was maybe, like you said, a, uh, you know, a quote unquote competitor, but a friendly competitor that you could rely on and, and kind of share what you were both going through. What were some of those unique things that you experienced and, and, and lessons learned, if you will, in terms of that you're going to take forward? Who would, like would like to start? I think that the... Uh, um the big thing is that it seemed like through the COVID thing, there's a really a big tipping point for the dentist to get to move in the digital realm. And I think uh, it was it was important for us to really, you know, uh, kind of sharpen our 
saw, so to speak, and uh, really learned that and such. And so really, uh, you know, with, like I said, the partners of the Oregon and also other laboratories, but also, you know, really, you know, nailing down some of the, the, the Itero reps, uh, who I know pretty well, and the, the, th the three shape reps and everything, to really kind of understand, you know, what it is on their side and can kind of pull it all together. Because we knew that when, when everything was coming back, uh, when all chips are down, the, the dentist just calls us, calls up the laboratory, and uh, they say, "Hey, you know, you know, can you help me out here?" We, it's important for us to uh, to be able to uh, be there for them. I mean, I think Atero. I mean, I don't I think Atero is a fantastic company, but they're the first people to tell you they have a four-hour wait time. You know, and and, that, and, that, and they're the best. You know, out of that, but uh, but it's important for us to be able to uh, um, be there for them. As as we uh, as we kind of uh, navigate through this together and such, a lot of talking to other people, a lot of talking to uh, the laboratories, vendors, and uh, all these just kind of figure what is the right answer, you know. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, we kind of went through the same thing. Like after COVID, so many of our doctors wanted to switch to digital or at least start looking at it. And having built those relationships with the different reps beforehand, there wasn't any kind of lag time. Like as soon as they called, we could get them in touch with who might be able to help them if they're looking for a scanner, get them set up with a lunch and learn that we kind of already had in our back pocket. So we just kind of had to pick the dates and kind of be ready to go. But during COVID, we kind of weren't sure where things were going to go, but I mean, before COVID, everyone was starting to go digital. So it's just kind of being ready for that. And now every time somebody calls, it's just like we have a system ready to go of getting the lunch and learns ready, getting them in touch on the rep they want to talk to and moving them forward and just kind of being that partner with them. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think uh, there was a backlog of work. We all felt that wave of COVID when things opened back up. And I, I know our team, I just saw people going above and beyond all the time. And you just rec had an opportunity to recognize. And I think a lot of people soared in that time. And you did see your customers seem like they all ran out and bought a scanner. Or they knew it was going to be the future or if they were ever questioning. So, yeah, I think that we did some CE with, with some of the scanning companies that were really helpful that really helped our customers with Very their good. decision. Yeah. All right, we're going to turn it over to you for a few minutes. So few minutes, any of the topics that we kind of started with thus far or anything that we haven't touched uh, that you would like to ask the panel, either individually um, or as a group, uh, who would like to kind of be the guinea pig to start us off this morning? All right. Well, let me add, let me, yes, go ahead. Yeah, and just for Curtis, so he hears us, I'm going to repeat audience questions just so you can hear. But Curtis, the question, um, to start off was is what what kind of social media channels are you using what things do you find working uh, certainly a reference to Instagram just um, you know it's it's out there more than ever in terms of being able to kind of look at what people are doing how they're doing it uh, so maybe let's start start with you Curtis on social media and, and 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 kind of where your efforts are and where you're spending your time and money there um, so yes we're on uh, multiple platforms that we're doing right now um, Honestly, uh, I'm from the analog age group, and so I've hired young people to kind of handle that for us. But um, we're, we're allowing our doctors to really dictate what direction we're going um, as far as digital and social media. Um, I really listen to our customers, and then I have my young staff uh, kind of adapt to that. Now, I don't have specific people that handle that. Um, I allowed my young people to, to come up with the ideas that we adapt into the lab as far as social media. Now, uh, some of the things we've done as far as our website, we have doctor portals that, um, it's, you know, having doctor portals has cut our phone calls almost in half where they can call and check on, or they can go on the doctor portals, check on their cases, communicate with our staff through the portals. Um, so that's working out really good. Uh, it's, you know, really you have to get our managers to really pay attention to that also. Sorry, is that feedback on my phone or on you guys? Um, it might be on yours, we, we hear you fine. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, but as far as the social media, we do take advantage of multiple platforms. Um, but the thing is, is you gotta stay on top of that constantly and, and watch it and, and keep adding content to it. So that's what I would advise. And uh, it's worked out really good for us. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, uh, 
They're on different platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and everything, so we're posting updates. Here in Chicago, occasionally you have a snow day and you can't make the routes, so it's a good way to communicate with customers. Um, we uh, and, and Curtis, like he mentioned, our, our website we're working on because we're getting more. Uh, we have a portal. Doctors can check case statuses. They can instant message us and you know add things to cases, upload photos, tell us they need a pickup, pay their bill, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, pla I mean, I think some of that communication. I, we have an HR uh, Paylocity is the name of it, and we 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 are kind of spread out over the Midwest. So it's a way to connect our people as we kind of have our own social media platform where we can welcome a new hire and other people from other parts of our company can congratulate them. They have you know groups, whether it's a Seinfeld or some show group. So we do a lot of pat on the backs, a lot of good communication within the company on a kind of a HR platform. Mm -hmm. It's kind of pretty cool. Um, we use primarily Instagram and Facebook. And when we first started it, we were very nervous and like wanting everything to be perfect when we were putting stuff out there. And now we've kind of come like, just getting stuff out there and starting it is more important. They're not gonna go back and search through all your stuff and nitpick everything. And we've really been focusing lately, putting like people out there just sit down when they're working on something, I take a picture of them at the bench, and it really kind of builds. A lot of times people will go search Facebook before Google, and when they see people's faces, if they know they, if, they, if they have a question and they call, they kind of know who they're gonna be talking to, um, who the lab is. So we've been really kind of focusing on our day-to-day. -day. They're nothing too special, nothing crazy. Like, yes, if we have a crazy case, we might post it out there, but it's more our everyday life of the lab putting out on social media. I'm not familiar with social media. Of course, uh, Some, somebody in the audience. Yeah, so I, 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 I owe all our social media success and uh, really the success of Frontier over the past couple of years to uh, my partner Gil, and uh, everybody knows Gil, and so Gil Frontier on Instagram, and uh, and you know it was a kind of a challenge that uh, uh, you know we set for ourselves uh, four years ago, and uh, we really do, did a deep dive into the social media platform, and you really realize how to do uh, a really big commitment to it. And uh, I don't think that in four years, Gil's missed one day of posting, not one day. And, uh, and so it's, but it's more than just posting. I think the, the important thing is people do, they, they think they'll post a crown. They say, hey, this is a crown. You can get it for $125. You know, call 1-800-NEW-CROWN or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. I think it's the, it's basically the, uh, the you know, many different things about there, but it's also just the, the story, the unique story that laboratories can tell. And uh, we try to like, you know, make them laugh, make them cry, educate them and have fun, you know. And, and you know, it's really uh, been something for them, engagement with our doctors and such. At first we were thinking like, well, we can put the doctor's names up there, then basically put your client list up there. Uh, we don't really care. It just we put it up there because we're trying to better dentistry, and uh, and that's what uh, Gil does, and he does it authentically. And and uh, he likes to make fun of me dancing sometimes, which is not good. But uh, but but more and more importantly, it is a as a great great platform uh, to be able to tell your story, your unique story, and then get it out there. But you have to commit to it. You really have to commit to it. When uh, Gil started doing that, he's thinking, oh, maybe two hours a day. The, the, the joke that I have sometimes, I get up early anyway, it's like I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I look at some emails and everything, then I go on Instagram and you know, Gil's been active since 2.30 in the morning, you know, and so that's, it's, 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 it's full on, it's full on, so. And another thing with that, um, make sure to reach out to different like Facebook groups, like for questions and things. There's so many people out there who just want to help and if you, whatever system you're using, if you search for it, there's probably some kind of group started for it where you can just put a question out there in the middle of the day and somebody's going to see it and be like oh i know the answer and just kind of help so don't be afraid to join the groups watch those groups you can learn from those too yes curtis i'm going to kind of pose a question from the audience um and so what kind of the the, the question's got two parts one is you know it, it, with your laboratory are you using anything either from like a intranet standpoint or an app where you have, you know, kind of use it for employee engagement and or potentially, you know, HR administrative uh, functions, you know, vacation approvals, those type of time tracking. So Melissa, just talk about that in terms of the tools that you might be using in that realm. Um, so where would you like to start? Um, we don't use anything too formal. I mean, what you're just saying, I was like, oh, that sounds exciting. <laughs> um, going back to social media, we have like a private 
like Renstrom Dental Studio employee group. So then we can post things there like so-and-so is going to be out sick today. Hey, we just got this good feedback, feedback um, phone call from a doctor. So we post things in there. But other than that, we don't have a formal system going. Um, we do have a, it's actually Pelosi is the name of it. Um, we were trying to figure out as you grew, you know, a vacation calendar can be a monstrosity when you have 200 people and some are in, you know, in this building. And then, so you're, it, it now this is uh, less paper passing. Um, we are, uh, you can submit time off. You can go, an employee can go right on their phone. Uh, they can clock in from their phone. There's like geofencing, so they don't have to line up at the time clock. Um, you can look at your back, your pay stubs, change things. So, and then it does have like a social media platform for within the company to make announcements. It was tremendously valuable in COVID when we things were changing and people didn't know, do I need a mask, do I not? Uh, and, and just make, we had to, you know, let people know someone tested positive, you know, so there was a lot of good announcements made on that platform. So, yeah, I would look into it. I mean, I think when you get to a certain point, it was, it's been very valuable for us. Brent, Brent what is your team? Yeah, we, we have similar things like that um, through our payroll stuff. But um, but one of the things with the management team, at least in uh, um, Eldorado Hills, we, we use uh, Slack a lot. And uh, Slack is very, very good because, uh, you, know, the, you know, the shipping department, the scheduling, the, the team leaders and such, you can have these things going back and forth. And as long as you can kind of sort of keep it straight, we have different channels for each one. So not everybody's on every channel. Um, and, uh, and but it is a good way to communicate things very quickly and just little little uh, points of information that the, the Slack channel is going all the time at our laboratory. So we don't have to get up and I mean, it's amazing. It's like sometimes you get up and you're like, where is that person? And you're just probably doing circles looking for each other. So but now the Slack now is really just to be able to uh, a great source of communication for us. Yep. Curtis, are, are you and your team using any particular tools for employee engagement or apps for that purpose? Uh, yeah, we have just a lab Instagram and Facebook that we communicate with our staff that way. Um, and of course, one of the reasons I'm not there is because uh, Dallas got about a half inch of ice and so none of the flights left out, but we had to shut the lab down for two days. And so we just put it out on our Instagram for our technicians and our staff so they can communicate that way. Uh, also, when they want to ask for time off or whatever, they, they do it that way. The managers control all that. Um, you know, we try not to have multiple people in multiple positions out the same day. So um, but we, we allow all of our managers to track through our in-house um, social media platforms. Very good. Uh, other questions from the audience? Sure. Yes, yes, sir. Curtis, the, the question we're going to come back to you on is just, you know, what kind of marketing uh, strategies and channels are you using outside of the social media, which we just covered? Um, and then, um, you know, I guess the, the follow-up follow -up question was on related to the clinical side, on, on pr production and things like that nature. So if you hit kind of capacity, how are you riding those waves, and, you know, in terms of unpredictability, you know, feast or famine, if you will, how are you, how are you getting prepared for that? So Brent, we'll start with you. Yeah, from our marketing point of view, it's like, you know, we were getting, like, we're big on the social media and uh, with Gil and, and uh, he does have a small team in Southern California to be able to, again, uh, get that out there and, and uh, tell the story of the laboratory and, and actually engage with the clients. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, ironically, you know, uh, we don't go, even though there was COVID, we, we don't go to very many dental conventions anymore. I hate to say that, but type of thing. But it's like you know, with with uh, posts that Gil puts out, he'll he'll hit forty thousand dentists in a morning, you know, and then start engaging with them and such, and tell them that story and everything. And we do all kinds of things and, and fun stuff. We got one coming out for uh, an Argon thing. We just did a, did a b big bling thing, and uh, and so we're going to uh, tag Argon here probably this morning on that. And uh, but it is uh, it is important to you know be consistent with that. You know, it, we, you know, Gil and I don't see each other very often because I'm in Northern California, he's in Southern California. We're at dinner the other night and he had uh, four doctors during dinner uh, become clients just through social media and the interaction. And his whole thing is that uh, the, at one time or another, you know, everybody's got this phone in their hand. And, and of course, you know, at different times, which that's the reason why Gil's up at two in the morning actually, because at you know, two in the morning doctors are getting up and they've done the workout on the East Coast and it's five in the morning, they'll pick it up. And then just the fact that someone answers them at five in the morning personally 
is a big, big deal. So obviously, I couldn't do that, um, but uh, but Gil uh, uh, does do that, and he does very well at that. With uh, with the the uh, as far as the production goes, you know, we have the ability to share amongst the laboratories, as uh, we can uh, we can ship stuff up to Vancouver and uh, ship stuff to uh, Milwaukee and, and back and forth and such. That does does help out uh, quite a bit because what happens is that. Um, is that you know as we're all getting busier and busier you know the number one thing used to be like doctor acquisition it's not really that's about number three and number four now sorry doctor acquisition like how are we going to get it done how are we going to source this stuff and everything and uh, and uh, then of course you know Gills you know we're getting more and more of these doctors coming in it's like that's like how am I going to produce this stuff you know and uh, but we have the flexibility of uh, sharing between the laboratories. Curtis, go ahead. Uh, have you answered this one? If you heard both of the key key, key parts, of that question. parts of that question. Yeah, as far as marketing, we don't do any external marketing, uh, mainly because uh, honestly, we pick up five to ten new doctors a week, um, but it's more word of mouth and things like that. Now, um, I say we don't do outside marketing, but I average doing about 55 lectures a year in our market. Uh, I'm always available for study clubs, things like that. We did build a, a new building with a large 70 seat learning center with an attached surgical suite. So I've opened that up to every company for free to do CE events in there. Um, so th as far as marketing, that's kind of, I say we don't do external marketing, but I, I do a lot of lectures, I guess, in a way that is external marketing. Um, so that's worked out really well for me. Um, I always tell lab owners that either you're working in your business or on your business, uh, there is a big difference. Um, I, I probably, pre-COVID, um, I was probably doing, uh, as far as going to CE events, I averaged five nights a week. Uh, my wife wasn't real happy about that, but I, I spent a lot of time going where doctors go and, and they got to where they were used to seeing me at CE events. And then suddenly they started bringing cases in to talk to me about it. So you just got to spend time and, and work on your business. That's, that's how I've always done it. Um, I can tell you, I talk to every implant rep in my area at least once a week. Uh, I reach out to them, ask them if everything's going well, anything I can help them with, things like that. Uh, in turn, when they have a difficult case that a doctor is looking to, to work on and their lab isn't comfortable doing it, they know they can call me. Now, my thing is, is I don't go solicit additional work from that doctor. I'm going to do the best job we can. But also know that that doctor um, is kind of in our wheelhouse when we want to grow our business. We, we have the ability to go to them and market if we need to. Let me ask the, the part two um, topic was how do you prepare your laboratory for, you know, when you are, are bringing on these new clients and, um, you know, you, we all, you all talked about just the difficulty of bringing, getting staff. Um, how do you prepare your team for, you know, I guess I'd say high production time periods where you might hit capacity. How do you prepare for that? Well, one thing I'm doing, um, it, to me, it doesn't make sense to buy more equipment and more space to have it set idle two thirds of the day. And so we're starting to, to leave our building open longer and longer to allow uh, technicians kind of split shifts um, we're actually seeing a lot of technicians reach out to us now because they know they can come in in the evenings and work. Uh, once again, I've got the, uh, the dental school students coming in at night and working. Uh, I, can, I can really see in the future that's going to be big for us. Um, uh, this is our first year to do it. We've got 13 students, and I've seen our production overall increase about 14% through the lab just by having those students in. They're motivated to work. I'm paying them piecework to come in and do that. So, uh, so we're able to scale pretty good by doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, I kind of repeating what Curtis said. We are flexible with our hours. We have people starting anywhere but like between three and four in the morning, and that's because that's what works for them, and they know what the workflow is like. But then our doors are also open till sometimes seven or eight at night because there's somebody else who's like, well, if I do this later at night, they'll be ready for the morning. Um, 
And one thing we've noticed a lot since COVID, like we've gotten, we've added about 20 people since before COVID to now. So like we went from like about 30 people to 50 people because of how much work we were getting in, we did keep adding people. But now if we get too much work in, like I'll be very open to with the employees and be like, if this is too much, let me know. Like I can start making calls and they'll be the first one to be like, I don't want you to call the doctor. But it's like, at some point, we don't want to break down on everything. So if there's certain cases, um, I feel like our doctors have gotten very reasonable since COVID. If I call and I'm like, we honestly just have too much work and not enough people right now, they'll pick a case and be like, this one can wait a little bit. And they don't want their cases rushed through. They want people with like fresh minds working on their cases. And they'll be like, no, this case over here, patient's leaving for vacation, we need that one done. But yeah, take your time on this case. So we just kind of have those conversations with the offices. And I think opening those lines of communication up, they get better feeling of like, we're real people, you're a real person, these are real patients. Like everyone can only do so much right now. So we just have conversations about it when it gets to be too much. And as far as marketing goes, sorry. sorry. Um, we aren't doing much out besides social media. We're not doing much marketing. It's all like word of mouth, just kind of letting the work speak for itself. But we have had a few where they're reaching out on their dental boards being like, hey, who do you use for this? And then somebody else will tag like runs from dental in it. And then somebody's like, oh, and just gives us a call right away. So it just kind of goes back to that social marketing and it just is kind of almost a snowball effect. Because once somebody hears somebody's using it, another person is like, oh, maybe I should use them too. So. Yeah, I think uh, on the workflow side of things, um, we have some, cro I mean, we do have like a, I was kind of mentioned like a technical call center. So if I need a, you know, two people on the technical calls and one of the technical person goes out and fills in on the floor. We try to build capacity and try to stay ahead of that growth because we were projecting things. And yeah, COVID was a, you know, that was kind of trial by fire. But at the same time, we're always trying to keep that pipeline full. I want to say overstaffed, but we have a lot of folks that are 50% productive. They're going to be 75. And then this person's 20, going to be 40. So we're just constantly training. So we have, a you know, for instance, we'll take a, a local person with no experience and they'll be designing 45 posterior crowns in eight months from the time they've known nothing. So, and, and to a certain standard, they're QC, they're trained. But, uh, you know, so we just, I don't want to say overstaff, but we've been there plenty of times where <laughs> morale's bad, you're bleeding out, and everyone's working overtime. I mean, being in business as long as we have, we've tried to figure out capacity. We have people on workflow that aren't technicians, so it takes the emotion out of it. It's not the QC person that's bombarded or whatnot. It's actually people walking around with lists that are not technicians, that are working with the managers to you know, communicate how do, we're gonna get this done. So that kind of takes some of the stress too. But a lot of it is, you know, don't let your doctors start snowballing on it. You know, you, yeah, we'll do rush cases, but you do need to have, you know, we die trim it. If it's short on time, we call on it. If they really, really need it, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. But you start to educate them, like, what's realistic? Because your workflow, if you have all these turnaround times that are all over the place, you at least need 80, 90 percent of something you can depend on to, you know, to schedule. Um, so that's educating your doctors a bit. On, that helps. But. Good, good. Other questions from the audience? Some good starters. We've got time for a few more. All right, so let's uh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. When we get a new case in from a new doctor, we just always make sure to give them a call right away. Let them know, like, we want to dial in your preferences as much as we can, so let us know what you like to see in your final crown seat. Um, kind of get background information as to why they're giving us a try, what problems they were having previously. Um, I mean, it's nothing too crazy. We literally just kind of flag it with, um, make it all colorful so everyone knows, like, hey, this is a new, new case. Um, and then, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, we also put it in our calendar, so after it goes out, we always call up on it a couple days after once they get a chance to see it, see how it went. And then we also do a 9.30 meeting every day. So in that meeting, I'll be like, hey, we got a new case in from so-and-so. This is where they're located. This is what the case is. So everyone in the lab has a chance to kind of hear about that new doctor. So when it comes across their bench, they're aware that it's there 
and like, this is a new case. If you have questions on it, don't be afraid to check in. We'd rather call and ask more questions with a new doctor than assume and then they get it back and they're like, oh, this isn't exactly what I was looking for just because there wasn't that communication, so. Good. Yeah, uh, with uh, new clients that come in, they usually come in through, you know, the Instagram and uh, what they have to do, we, we put a little bit of onus on them. If they want to be able to uh, join the laboratory, we, we uh, direct them to a contact form to fill out all their information and everything. And instead of us calling up to get their information, they have to do it, they send it off and then it goes right to Gill. Then uh, Gil says, hey, welcome to Frontier and everything like that. Please respond back. You know, here, here's your price list and everything like that. Please respond back to uh, let's do it. And it, it kind of puts the onus on them and how serious they are about sending a case in. And if, if they do say let's do it right then, then when they say let's do it, um, it's triggered automatically that uh, Gil sends out an email to one of our client manage, uh, the technical managers we call smile designers and we, we have this the smile designer contact the doctor through a text message to set up a time within 10 minutes and uh, 10 minutes there they've texted they've texted the doctor to set up a time to talk to find out what their uh, um, what their uh, time zone is and everything and uh, they're just blown away by the fact that it's like wow someone got back to me like just like that and then usually they have a case ready to go and uh, we you know, we let them know how it's going to you know ask them how it's going to be in digitally analog if they can get boxes and everything out to them and get the process going once the case is in there the smile designer who is assigned to that uh, reviews the case calls the con uh, the doctor one more time or text text message them said good to go and just follow the way through so. Yeah, we, we uh, keep track. We put them in a, a purple pan. That's the brightest pan in the lab. So we, we keep track of what we call like a five case conversion rate. So we, you know, case comes in, our, our inside sales is going to reach out to their front office and get, you know, our drivers there within this hour every day, doctor preference forms, lab department contact names for scheduling and for technical things. So we really try to engage them as much as we can in that first. We find if we get to five cases, I, don't quote me, but there is a percent that just quadruples that your likelihood of keeping them. Yep. So we work hard to get to the fifth case. And once you get to five, it seems to be a pretty good number. To Curtis, we're going to uh, close on this topic with you. Just uh, in terms of you, you obviously have a, a lot of new client acquisition. What Kind of what are the core pieces of your touch points in your onboarding process to not only bring them in the door but keep them? Um, well, we do have doctor preference forms that we do send out. Um, but the nice thing is with the world that we live in now, communication is so much easier than it used to be. Um, so my managers, I, I let them really keep in touch with their, their customers and and get the feedback and, and try to adjust things. Now, when a new customer calls me, uh, one thing I always ask them, I always ask them if they're happy with the lab that they're using. And they're always shocked when I ask them that, because I always say, if, if, if you're happy, don't leave. Uh, and I hope that other labs would do the same thing because we are very busy and, and we don't need additional work. Um, but that's very refreshing for a doctor to hear that when we ask them why they're, they're leaving and uh, if they're happy or not. Um, so it's really communication, setting up relationships with doctors. Now, one thing that I did right when COVID hit, I sent out an email to every doctor I've ever done a case with and said that by July 1st of this year, we will be completely digital, which means we'll no longer accept any analog impressions. Now, um, I've told a lot of lab friends this, and they thought I would have a massive pushback, but at this point, we're at 84% digital. So um, we're driving the market. We're, we're Instead of following the, the leader, we are the leader in our uh, marketplace here. And uh, I like that. I like, uh, well, the term I use to my, my managers is asses and elbows. It's, uh, as long as everybody's looking us at, at us that way, then they we're in a good position in this market. Thank you, thanks. Thank you. All right, um, All right. Um, transition, transition to a couple of things here, and we may have time for a little bit of Q&A at the very end. But um, let's, we're gonna always end on the positive, so we're gonna start with the challenging market trends that you see in the next couple of years from your perspectives. Um. Challenges that I see is when you go to meetings and things like this, taking in all the information, 
but taking it back and like making the decision that's best for your lab. You might hear of other labs doing something and it's human nature to think oh, like, oh, should I be doing this if they're doing that? And just making sure you're making the right decision for your lab. Um, I know we've said it multiple times, but there's just so, so much work out there for everyone. There's place in the market for a one-person lab or hundreds of people. Um, everyone has their own niche, so just make sure to kind of dial in yours and make sure you're doing what's best for like you, your lab, your people, and your offices, um, but still like knowing what's going on around you. When we, uh, my husband and I took over the lab, we kept hearing how labs were consolidating and doing all that kind of stuff and we were nervous about it all and we weren't sure what we were, if we are making the right choice. Um, but we stayed a third generation lab and right now we're thriving and couldn't be happier with the decision. Um, so just making sure you take in everything and just kind of do what's best for you with that information. Curtis, what, what are some of the challenging market trends that you see, whether it's material, equipment, or personnel? Well, I can tell you something that, that is kind of troubling right now that, um, that I'm seeing, because everybody's switching to zirconia, which I think is great. We're getting away from the layered ceramics. Um, but getting doctors to understand shades you know, most doctors are still using the Vita VMK 68 shade guide that was developed in the early 70s or late 60s. And they're asking for our zirconias to match that shade guide, which it's not. So we, we have to basically have shade guides for our zirconia that we set expectations. Um, with the new materials that are coming out and all that, um, doctors aren't really understanding what the materials are and what we can do with the materials. So um, I think as lab owners that we have to start setting the expectations as far as the materials and techniques and things like that that are available. And, and we have to educate our clients about what's new to the market and we have to set the market. Yeah, I, I kind of think the same. You, you, there's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of positives, but you got to know kind of what you're plan is and what your goal is and I think you know strategic planning was a term we used to throw around and we weren't quite that honestly going back 15 years we weren't that great at it but what we've been how we've been able to grow is looking three years out so we know when that opportunity comes we, we've identified it as well, we're going to do this we're going to be in a position to do it so I think you now more than ever kind of know where you want to take your business and don't get distracted and, and there are things that are, you know the DSO world's hitting us, so are you going to jump and try to save that account? Are you going to, you know, are you going to be able to produce crowns at a price point? So know kind of what you, what your wheelhouse is and how you're going to grow your business the way you want to grow. Because there's, you can grow in volume, you can grow by price, you can grow with acquisition. There's a lot of ways to succeed in the market right now, so that's a good thing. Yeah, I think the, uh, like, the, the common theme here is that uh, you know, you know, sourcing people, getting employees, you know, that's, that's going to be very, very challenging. But the, the answer to that is obviously the, the move towards digital, which also is very challenging. I'm definitely not the smartest guy in this room down here, but, but you go downstairs, you see all those machines. I'm like, oh my God, what do these things even do? I don't even know. How, do you, how would you even choose? How do you, how do you, you know, we, we know which, which one's better than the other? But being able to have uh, you know an understanding of that, and then of course on the on the clinical side as well as like you know getting these doctors is to get these the scanners and they have to understand these workflows. We still get this thing. It's like you know I don't understand what a scan body is. I scanned my impression coping. Does that work for you? Type of thing and and things like that and just being able to understand that. Where I see where I see this going is that you know the laboratories that are, are you know going in the future they're going to be more you know it's it's actually less about the crown and more about the process. And so, you know, you know a, lot, a lot of laboratory owners, I know they're hiring engineers, you know, and uh, process engineers and being able to get this stuff through. They have an understanding of that. And I think that's, that's very, very important to be able to understand that side of it there as it moves uh, towards that. Uh, you know, kudos for uh, Curtis to 84% digital is amazing, you know. And, uh, and so I imagine, you know, it, it's some growing pains on that as such and a lot of trial by errors like we always like to do. But, uh, but for sure you know, that, that's going to be, you know, challenging, but an exciting challenge. Yeah. Curtis, we're going to um, have you open this, uh, this 
portion and just talk about the positive market trends, which you've articulated a few already, but just anything else that you see coming down the pike, just that this is the right time, the right time, if you will, for the market. Probably the one thing that I'm the most excited about right now is digital dentures. Um, everybody is wanting to know how to do digital dentures. And, and one thing I keep telling all the companies that are coming out with new lab processes for doing digital, I, I, I believe their focus is on the wrong side. Uh, the focus needs to be on the clinical side on how to do uh, the information transfer. How do we get the information to the lab so we can do a digital denture? Um, nobody's really focusing on that. So I see that as a big trend. Uh, I partnered with all the iOS companies in our market, and we've kind of developed our own way of doing digital dentures. And that's been very successful, which has opened up a whole new marketplace for me as far as growing my business. Now, in my opinion, the single unit posterior crowns are going to be pretty much non-existent for labs in probably the next 10 years. Now, that's my opinion. Um, even if they're not, it's something that I'm not focusing on because everybody wants them a lot cheaper than I'm willing to do them for. But there's certain things that we can build our business on. That's implants, removables, and aesthetics. And that's going to be my focus. Uh, but right now, it's the digital denture market. Um, I, I want to be an industry leader in that. Uh, we're at about 60 to 70 percent digital on our dentures right now, and I only see that increasing in the next six months or so. I, my goal for my lab is to be about 95 percent by the end of the year. Very good. Very good. Brent, go ahead. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's been our success when we, we, our laboratory is really focused on the cosmetic side is that with, uh, with a lot of more Zoom calls and, uh, you know, FaceTime calls, anything like that, it's really, really, uh, you know, people are seeing themselves. And seeing, uh, you know, that well, they, they can they can really like to you know upgrade their smile and such. So I think it's an exciting time to be able to uh, to do that on the cosmetic side um, uh, for us. I think that's just going to keep growing. I think that with the the advancements, even though there might be some shade issues with zirconia and such, but there is uh, the zirconia is looking better than it ever has, you know. And I think that uh, with that and uh, you know with the process on the digital side, there you can really. Uh, do a you know just do a phenomenal job on the the aesthetics and such, and then of course have uh, you know the uh, good function with it as well too, so it'll, it'll last a long time. And uh, then you can have the people as are coming up and they're learning these processes stuff like that. You're not really having to have train these people to doing you know feldspathic veneers anymore. You know I think that's uh, I think it's really really get a nice uh, uh, result with this stuff. I think uh, if only I was, you know, 20 years younger, you know, and uh, what a what a, uh, a great thing to be uh, coming into this business, and uh, you know, with the stuff that, that that we're seeing, like I mentioned, you see these these kids downstairs going through this stuff. It's crazy. It's it's, it's wonderful, and um, but you know, it still it still excites me quite a bit that there's some great opportunities for us here to uh, to really move this industry forward. Okay. Luke, yeah, I think uh, just. You know, I think it's the opportunity, like added revenue streams. I mean, you see aligners, you see surgical guides, you see all these things. And I, honestly, I think the value of the technician or the dental lab has never been greater. And I think we're trying to sort through a lot of the advancements and, and keep our customers um, on the front lines and, you know, make good decisions for them. And, and they value us even greater. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of this, too, I mean, we've some of these workflows, you know, you can become more profitable, less layering. But, you know, we're not doing porcelain butt margins like we used to have to do. So I think there is profit centers in the lab. You know, we all know the alloy and, our, you know, we, we, that used to be a big one, but we've found ways to replenish that. And a lot of it is to, you know, you can manage your labor costs with some of these uh, materials we're using and some of the, the equipment and the machines and the printers and the mills that we're using. So. Uh, yeah, I think right now everything's just really exciting. Like five to seven years ago, I felt like when we went to lab meetings, I felt more of a like scare, doom and gloom type thing coming around. But uh, now with all the technology that's out there, um, it's just other tools for people to use to do better work and to provide better service. Um, the NADL showed how wages for technicians are increasing, which I think just shows the demand for our industry out there, the demand for good quality work and service. Um, 
and I think, like I said, with all the students coming in and younger generations, all the like CAD CAM and printing and milling that they can do, it's gonna it's gonna be fun for them, and they get to realize that they're helping people smile and build people's confidence again in like a fun environment. So I think all those things together is just really like there's a little like, ball of excitement going through the industry right now that is just gonna keep rolling and escalate on. Yes. I'm just to transition to the audience for a couple of polling questions. How many of you have 3D printers in your laboratories? How many of you have more than one 3D printer in your laboratory? Okay. How many of you are full service laboratories? Okay. The reason I asked that second question is uh, Randy and I were at a session on Thursday and there was some data that was referenced that, you know, in the last three years, the, the number of laboratories that effectively have transitioned to become a full service laboratory has tripled in the last three years. Uh, it's still a small percentage, like 27%, say they're full service, but you know, a few years ago was you know, just, just over 10%. So I was just kind of curious on that. And you, and you talked about some of that just with the growth opportunities that are out there and people you know, just leaving things on the table and you know, if you can expand what you can offer, then you've got just, it's a nice time to be here. So, Any other follow-up statements? Curtis, we'll uh, let you close out uh, close from out. your standpoint and then we'll transition to the rest of the panel for some, some closing comments. Any other words, uh, tips of wisdom for that you can share with the audience? Um, the, the, the one thing that I would say is, is don't be afraid to run your business. In, in other words, I had to get past my own ego before my business could grow. And, and by saying that, I'm, I used to think I could make every doctor happy. And I, I finally had to get to the point to realize that we can't make everybody happy. And once I realized that and got rid of some of, well, we've all heard the 90-10 rule. So, um, you know, 10% of your, your clients give you 90% of your problems. And, and I finally realized that my staff and, and our mental health in the lab is so much better when we realize that we, we, couldn't make those doctors happy. And so we just had to move on from them. And then the numbers and, and things like that, it's it just really blossomed. And so I, I would say I had to get past my own ego of thinking that I could do everything and make everybody happy. Um, that's really helped boost my business. And, and that makes me excited for the future and where our business is going. I mean, uh, for us, I mean, I think now more than ever it is, we talked about the year of the technician and just investing in your people and developing your teams and giving them opportunities to, to flourish because they're going to be the ones that's going to take your organization to the next level. And that's what we see in our lab, all the leaders in the future, you know, they were all, you know, developed a lot of them, most of them, and, and it's exciting for them, exciting journey for both of you. So support your people and, and take care of your customers. <laughs> yeah. Randy? Um, I would say learn from one another and take in everything, but make sure you're doing your own thing. Um, when you see labs out there that are being successful, there's something different about them. They're doing something that somebody else isn't. Um, if there was a book written where it was just like, this is how you run a dental lab, like we'd all be doing the same thing. Um, but obviously there's not, and there's a reason, is you want to be unique. You want to do your own thing. Um, take care of your people the way you want them to be taken care of. Um, and kind of like you were saying, it's okay not to be working with everybody. You don't want to work with everyone. It's a headache when you have too much work to do as it is. So you can have a chance to be a little bit more picky on like who you're working with and making sure you're working with people who respect you, respect your employees, and what you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to add to that, absolutely, is that it's interesting that I think about this here. We have to, all the people that are in here made this trip, you know, coming out of COVID. We're still in the masking thing and like that. And all the lab owners are here and they're thinking about the problems. And of course, we're here to support the dentists who are across the way at the McCormick Center looking at, uh, you know, you know, whatever they're looking at type of thing. And I don't think that dentists, you know, they, they put trust in us, but they don't think they really realize what's going on. And I think that uh, it's, it's interesting to me that they, a lot of the dentists don't come over here to kind of, I've seen a few dentists in there, they're kind of poking around, they're seeing what's going on. But 
this is a totally different thing. This is we, we're, this is like they're like technology companies now, you know, and they're relying on us. And it, for for a, as big a part of their dental office, a dental laboratory is. It's amazing to me how they they really just trust us. And I think that's that's where we have to be able to do is to you know come to these things, learn these things. I have to go down and look in that uh, thing downstairs. Okay, what does that machine do, and how much does that cost, and, and really trying to do that because that's what we need to do at the end of the day to uh, you know, really, the most important thing is take care of their customers, their, their patients, and, and, and take care of them and such. And so that's what our industry is all about. And I just think that sometimes they don't uh, un understand that, but that's our job, but that's our job. And so kudos to everybody who's come to this thing. I appreciate you guys coming and talk to me. I certainly, like, I'm not the smartest person in I'm not even sure I should be up on the stage, to be honest with you, but, um, but uh, it's uh, kudos to all of you and uh, pushing this stuff forward. And, uh, and uh, I you know, hope to, to learn more from everybody as we get to know everybody better. So, there you go. Curtis, thank you for being with us this morning, and uh, we really appreciate the value that you added, and so thank you for that. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you to Argon for uh, the fourth uh, panel, and so we're glad to have it. Uh, so, yeah. I just, you know, there's a lot of focus, obviously, on the people, as it always should be. Um, and so just obviously just uh, reference, you know, certainly at most recent LMT had a really good, a lot of great in-depth uh, discussion on recruitment and retention and what's working out there. So I encourage you, if you haven't really looked at that issue, it's got a lot of great tips in there. So um, we'll go ahead and close out this session. Just thank you again. Uh, be safe going home. Go downstairs and buy some stuff, or East and West Wings. And uh, we will see you here next year. So thank you, Argon. Thank you.